Welcome to day nine of the Happy Poly Day series. Today I am joined by Sky, who uh, goes by Femme Meow, and Nayeli, who goes by Anti Mononormative on Instagram. Uh, Sky is a bi demisexual femme content creator and digital artist who edits vintage pop novel covers to make them modern and queer. And Nayeli's account focuses on anti colonial perspectives on polyamory, relationship anarchy, and all that good stuff. Um, so, welcome to the Happy Poly Day series, Nayeli and Sky. Um, and yeah, my first question for you is like, what motivated um, each of you to kind of start your uh, your respective pages? Um, Nayela, you can go first. Okay. Well, hello. Thank you for having me. So I first off, I think I forget to like mention this quite often. Like my actual like little background as like as a person who am I? Um, so I'm also queer and indigenous. I should really put that in my bio sometime. Um, and I really just made my account in an effort to get more conversations going about non-monogamy and just the whole structure of mononormativity, like the whole social institution from like a very political perspective, because I, I feel like there's a lot of missing context for the history of how our relationships became stigmatized in the first place. And I really wanted to just start more conversations about that. Yeah, that's great. Um, and Sky, what about you? My page is just like a chaotic meme page that developed from my personal account in 2019. Um, but I think it's really beautiful because it kind of chronicles my like coming out and deprogramming from growing up in an oppressive cult. So um, I would not say that I'm like an educator like Nayeli. I love her stuff and I learn from her. Um, but I more just make memes as a way of like processing and recounting my experiences in polyamory. So I would love to hear more about, um, you know, your polyamory slash kind of relationship anarchy slash non-monogamy kind of um, origin story. So, um, you know, like I know both both of you like have like very, very different perspectives and, uh, you know, coming into this. And so, um, yeah, I would love to hear more about like how you came across it, you know, like um, maybe like what were your early struggles, like practicing or, you know, not not even early struggles, like, you know, current struggles, you know, like what, um, like what, you know, you know, what, what has, what have been kind of the, the benefits and drawbacks of practicing non-monogamy for you? Um, and, you know, what are your anchoring reasons for, for doing it? Um, and yeah, just generally kind of just like sharing your personal story and um, however much detail you feel comfortable. Um, so uh, Sky, I'd like to start with you because um, you've talked on your page before about how you grew up in uh, Scientology. Um, and uh, could you also explain like, you know, what Scientology is for some people who don't know? Um, and yeah, talk yeah. about kind of how you moved from that to like where you are today. Yeah, so my parents were not involved in um, the church at all. I ended up getting into it in like a kind of roundabout way. And you have to remember I'm 29, like forget Tom Cruise on the couch and like all the crazy stuff that we know about Scientology now it's like the internet wasn't even really a thing back then so it was just this kind of like weird you know religion that people were like okay it's kind of weird but like, like innocuous um, and my mom got a job at this company that was run by and staffed primarily with Scientologists so her friends ended up being Scientologists and they had kids my age and then I ended up going to school with them so I ended up getting into like they don't call it like a Scientology school but they use study technology and teachings from L. Ron Hubbard who is the founder of Scientology um, even though it's not like intentional indoctrination the fact that like 90 percent of the staff is Scientologists and like most of the student body is mm. um it still very much rubbed off on me um and there were just little things like absolutely it was just implied that you know homosexuality was um Ellen Hubbard quote is quoted as saying it's an aberration against nature in Dianetics which was like his first book that um you know, blew up and is what basically led to him founding Scientology. It's a crock of shit. It's literally just like psycho, like psychiatry, like with aliens and no founding, no foundational knowledge, and like no leg to stand on. It's, it's absolutely, absolutely been debunked mul multiple times. Um, but like, as I got older, so like in my senior year at this, um, school that I was at, I specifically remember like in our debate team, 
we were debating abortion and like of course you debate abortion you debate gay marriage because this was in like 2007 mm. and um the teacher allowed because she was a Scientologist of course she allowed it um one of my other classmates to like cite Dianetics in this debate as like proof that homose like abortion should be wrong and that homosexuality is an aberration against Whoa. nature. Like Owen Hubbard believes he believes in I call it um sci-fi evangelicalism. I was just talking to Purity to Polyamory about that. Like I have a <laughs> lot in common with Christian people because it's like they believe the same shit just with more like cuckoo like alien sci-fi shit you know <laughs> so he he believes in um there's all these rules about pregnant women like on campus if any of the teachers were pregnant you're not really allowed to like talk around them in certain ways you're not allowed to touch them because they believe that the fetus is like hearing everything and taking in everything oh my um, god yeah so that's their like reasoning for being super anti-abortion and then for being anti-gay, his justification is that um, he believes that gay people are covertly hostile. So there's a tone scale in Scientology and you 4.0 is like the top of the tone scale. It's called um, total intention, I think. And they believe like all Scientologists strive to be at tone, they call it tone 40, even though it's 4.0 mm -hmm. at all Like times. a GPA. So structured yeah, homophobia basically. interesting yeah yeah it's structured homophobia and they also have um that's how they also rationalize that um mental illness is not a real thing and that it can be cured with um scientology auditing because like anxiety and depression they don't call it anxiety or depression is on the tone scale so if you find yourself there you know like i was describing basically the symptoms of anxiety i didn't know what that was then it was basically like, oh, well, you, you just need to get auditing. It was like, like psychiatry, auditing. any kind of auditing. Yeah, that's where you're sitting there with like cans. It's also like a crock of shit. And it's supposedly like measuring your energy and somebody's sitting across from you. Yeah, it's like a whole other thing. Oh, we didn't wow. actually do auditing at this school, but um, they had just stopped doing auditing at that school. Like, not that long before I went there. But um, anyway, so yeah, they believe that homosexuality can be cured. They believe that like queer people, gay people are at 1.1, which is covertly hostile. So basically, yeah, that we are not genuine people that were like sneaky and evil, basically. That's what I was taught. Um, so my best friend when I was living in California, his older sister, um, I don't know what they had found, maybe porn or something. Um, and she, like, I think it's really funny. I knew I was queer very early on. And like, I just think it's funny that queer people can like sense each other. Mm -hmm. And I remember meeting her and being like, there was a kinship there. You're one of us. I thought she was really fucking cool. I mean, she was definitely like more mask. And so I was like, oh, she's cool. And then, yeah, it came out that she was gay. And then she was just kind of like, whisked away and nobody really talked about it so they don't have like conversion camps but essentially she was getting like intense auditing oh for my god probably months and months on end in order to like try and cure her then also i think that my friend whose older sister it was i think that he is bi or queer um he was very very frustrated very, mm -hmm. very frustrated. He had like a lot of emotional problems. And I think that he was queer and wasn't able to, you know, explore that. And then it came out that his younger sister too, who also went to the school was also caught with lesbian porn on her phone. So she got kicked out of the school too. Wow. So okay. I, so there's, so there's just this epidemic of, you know, just like queer people kind of being kicked out or whisked away or taken away like around you. And then you're like also questioning your identity and you were like, oh my God. Yeah. So like, how did right. all of that, you know, like growing up in Scientology, you know, like all like these beliefs like being like pushed on you you know like kind of making you like like fear like who you were like fear kind of things about yourself like you know hate yourself like even yeah. you know like how did that kind of influence you know your beliefs about I guess like sexuality identity like relationships you know like how did that yeah. kind of come into it and um you know more importantly like how did you break out of that eventually I'm like I don't know if I ever did because there was like the Scientology programming but then there's also just the societal programming too mm. like I was talking to 
um, purity to polyamory. And I'm like, it, I mean, it still exists, but like, especially in the nineties, just the misogyny and, um, you know, the gender roles and all that bullshit and the Disney, you know, I grew up with Disney. So mm-hmm. just getting that like Disney indoctrination, um, and then also Scientology is super, um, sexually repressed, you know, sex negative. I was talking about like the card for me that pulled that where everything else just crumbled was fully accepting my queerness because nice. once I accepted that, then you start questioning everything else. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. And I was in, um, an abusive relationship when, um, I pulled that card. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I don't know if you followed my content, but yeah, yeah. I was groomed by, um, a 31 year old man when I was 19. And so that was like five years in that relationship. And it's really shitty that like my origin story into polyamory is like really traumatic and Mm -hmm. born out of abuse, Mm -hmm. but it was really my only way to like escape that relationship. Like he had kind of, I had divulged where I was like, you know, I, I don't think I'm straight. Like he was open about that. And he was supportive of that, which of course most men are because they're like low key fetishizing it. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was like, yeah, if you want to like explore that, like, yeah, let's do an open relationship. And we didn't do like a joint account. I was like, no, I want to do this on my own. Like, fuck you. Like, I hate you. I would break up with you if I could, but I can't. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. um, here I am. And so, you know, I made it, made accounts and, um, but this was back in the early days. I like ran out of women. I was getting really frustrated with like unicorn hunters and like people are looking for friends. And so I ran out of women and I'm like, okay, I guess I'll look for dudes. And then you just find dudes. It's just so easy. um, (laughs) But but anyway, I broke, I I lied to him all the time, broke our rule. I, it was not agreed upon that I would be talking to men. It was just women. Yeah. So yeah, I lied about that and then just started being super reckless and going out and I was having lots of sex with (laughs) lots of different people. And it was a very like chaotic time in my life, but Mm -hmm. I had never been able to do that and to just explore and be free. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was the card. And it really did just feel like everything started crumbling. I ended up finally leaving him. Um, I fully like came out and then, yeah, you just start questioning everything. Like I was having all these great connections with people and I was like, I don't want to choose and I don't want to do this again. I don't want to live with somebody. I don't want to do the whole dating and then like, oh, we say I love you. And then like, I'm so tired of it. Yeah. And I think that it's because I was in that super aspr- uh, oppressive, <laughs> restrictive um, environment for so long. You know, I'm not saying that I won't like live with somebody again, but it's a hard no for me right now. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. why I love solo polyamory and relationship anarchy is where I've landed yeah yeah for sure um yeah so so Nayeli um I know that you generally kind of uh identify as like a relationship anarchist um and you know like a lot of your content is like really spicy um which is why like I love it so much <laughs> because love it. like you're getting to like the hard hitting kind of things you know like I think um you know my like I'm personally guilty of this myself like me and a lot of other content creators whenever we're talking about like you know um when people are like oh is monogamy a choice is polyamory a choice like what is natural or unnatural and like you know um like is it like a political political identity or is it just like a relationship style and then I think a lot of us like really try to skirt around it because it's like this is difficult to talk about right but then no you just get right to it you're just like (laughs) it's all info um and like die mad about it um and like and I love it like I think like your voice is so important um and like really just like cuts through like all the bullshit (laughs) um Mm -hmm. and so yeah like I you know what's your origin story like what what kind of um you know was there like a pulling the card moment uh, for you like like there was for Sky or like um you know was this always something that just kind of felt natural to you you know like what's your story yeah well first of all thank you because I I do strive to be like the one asking like the spicy questions you know (laughs) because like I created this account specifically to ask people the engage with the discussions that I don't see so that's great um okay so I think I have a rather unique story with getting to polyamory just because Mm -hmm. I still have never technically been in a long-term relationship with anyone and that's super uncommon in polyamorous spaces because a lot of people assume like that in order to be polyamorous you have to have a relationship with multiple people at the same time Mm -hmm. and for me I've 
identified as polyamorous and I've that's affected my dating life for the past two years I'm mm -hmm. currently 22 I just turned 22 and that's still even though I haven't had any multiple partners at the same time like I still have had that shaping my dating life it's like I meet someone and it's like hey by the way I don't want to do monogamy ever for political mm -hmm. personal reasons and they're like hey bye like you know it's just an ongoing cycle yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah I remember um, you made but... a I remember you made a TikTok where you were just like you know everyone's like yeah you know like like I'm anarchist and all these stuff but like they don't want to share their love like the one thing yeah. that they want to share <laughs> <laughs> exactly especially like with my generate or just with gen z in general like everybody's starting to finally question capitalism and the long-term effects of colonialism and they're all for that you know anti-racism anti-capitalism but then nobody wants to bring these ideas to their personal life and i'm like very interesting like on one hand i understand why people do it because i feel like if you look at the structure of mononormativity like the whole reason why it was created was in a way to just commodify human intimacy mm. um and i think there's a reason why and like, like that the right there i love that yeah. embroidered on a pillow oh yeah like uh, mononormativity yeah i think i wrote it on a post-it the other day like sometimes i'll just you know um i have really good ideas and i just write them down and then i find them later on and i'm like yes this would make a great infographic mm -hmm. um but yeah i think the way I started thinking about mononormativity had to do with just my observations as a single person for most of my upbringing. So while I was in high school, I was that kind of person who just never really dated anyone. Like I did kind of want to, but I kind of struggled with um, just in general. Like it's, it's funny when I look back on it now because it's not even that I had a lot of crushes and like I just didn't connect with them it's like I struggled to even have crushes on people because I was yeah, like what's, yeah, what's yeah, the yeah. big deal like what's the hype behind monogamous relationships with people in your hometown like I just didn't really understand it um and I think it has a lot to do also with the fact that I probably I I, I consider myself to have like undiagnosed ASD I'm still very careful about like how I talk about autism just because I know there's like a huge um a huge contextual what's the word like I saw an infographic about it today um somebody talking about like the reasons why there should be more people talking about undiagnosed ASD and like mm -hmm. how not everyone has access to diagnoses yeah and how yeah. just in general like I have a lot of colonial critiques about like the whole institution of western science and medicine mm -hmm. under capitalism so I could go into that like on a whole <laughs> other episode um but in general like I I do consider myself to be neurodivergent and I think that has a lot to do with the way I struggled with certain kinds of socialization growing up. And just the more that I was not actually engaging with monogamous relationships, it gave me the time to really just reflect on whether that was actually something that I wanted. Mm -hmm. So I think by the time I got to, I don't know, my like last year of high school, that was when I came out. And also my experience with like coming out as queer was like, um, I feel like a lot of people, they talk about like, oh yeah, like there's this one moment where I was like looking, thinking about girls and I was just like, yes, that was amazing. <laughs> and, like I did have those moments throughout the years, but I feel like for me, it was really more of this realization that my, the only reason why I thought I was straight all those years was because people told me that was the default. And I was like, mm -hmm. wait, but I feel like I'm kind of pressuring myself to even have crushes on men. Like this doesn't even feel right. Um, so yeah, I think once I got the language for that in recent years, I realized that was just me kind of questioning compulsory heterosexuality. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it was more just like, a, oh, I think I'm equally attracted to everybody or like, or gender isn't necessarily a determining factor. That's where my queerness kind of manifested itself. Mm -hmm. um, and with polyamory, it was more of me realizing that monogamy just didn't quite makes sense I think it's it, it was the experience of just seeing it not work for like everybody around me and I'm like obviously the structure itself isn't like inherently bad and like monogamy can work and people can be in lovely romantic relationships with monogamy it was more just the way people would blindly go into it mm -hmm. even though the yeah. outcomes were always very similar and I was like why does everybody keep doing this um and then I started learning about the historical reasons why people got into the family structures that we have now so like the whole history of settler colonialism trying to commodify human beings and put them into different family structures because yeah. it's easier to manage 
bodies that way really specifically like with black and indigenous people in the US too, like they experience very unique um, erasure of their ancestral family structures through that, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so I think in college as an undergraduate, I was studying critical gender studies. Mm-hmm. And that also really changed things for me because that was when I was really um, encountering this history firsthand and having discussions with other people about it. And even though we never actually talked about polyamory, like we would discuss like the history of, um, you know, people getting put into families that a like monogamy was central to all of that. And also capitalist development in the US was also relying heavily on the way people would build families and they would encourage reproductive, um, just general reproduction between people. And in order to reproduce, you need heteronormativity. So like everything's just connected. And I think what I really have been doing in the past few years is um, thinking about heteronormativity and mononormativity in very similar ways. And Mm -hmm. I don't disconnect them from my anti-capitalist and anti-colonial critiques Mm. Mm. so yeah it's like I I just kind of it just kind of happened like I I am polyamorous I think I would be like solo poly if I had any partners at the moment right now I just kind of live in a city where I don't really want to date anyone here (laughs) so uh, maybe (laughs) in the future I think maybe once I move to a different city things will change but right now I'm just I'm just here. I'm just vibing. I just, I like to critique things. So <laughs> that's me. Yeah. I like I remember you, uh, you re- solo poly, if you don't have other partners. I mean, that's why I liked it because I was single for so long. And when people would be like, oh, you're polyamorous, but you don't have partners. And then I would just say, well, I'm self-partnered always. Like mm. I am my own mm-hmm. partner. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think people need to also talk about like their relationships with themselves and how that develops. Because I think like even when I will have more partners um, in the future, I still think like my own relationship with myself, how that developed is still like the most important relationship mm-hmm. that I've had so far. So in that's general, how more I love fucking with here. monogamous people because they'll be like, oh, I'm monogamous. I'm like, well, but like you have a relationship with yourself still first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So technically, you're That's not. True. <laughs> 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 That's point, yeah. But I mean, yeah, no, I feel like people, a lot of monogamous people get into relationships and do just become this blob, this hom- homogenous st- structure. And I'm yeah. like, you two are still separate mm-hmm. people. Like, you're still your own thing. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and it's, it's, um, it's really interesting kind of because I have I, I I definitely relate to some bits of your uh, your story Naomi where like you know um, I didn't have this like big realization about being queer it was just kind of like oh um, mm-hmm. I like guys and then at one point I was just like maybe I like girls too I'm gonna go try yeah, that out and then I did exactly, yeah. and then I was like oh I like them too cool <laughs> and that was just that was that was just it really you know like I didn't have a whole like <gasps> kind of moment you know because um yeah I mean like my, my family is definitely like really homophobic like I think to this day my, my mom is still like in the very very much in the camp of like uh, like I I accept but I don't agree which is mm-hmm. not really accepting at all no. um but but it is what it is you know um and um but I was very fortunate to have like you know been um like I, I I you know I watched a lot of like American TV like growing up like in, in Hong Kong and you know like even though like my school was pretty homophobic and my family was pretty homophobic like the media that I immersed myself in was very much not um and then so like I didn't kind of develop like as much kind of like you know like internalized homophobia as I feel like I would have otherwise um and so then you know coming out as queer for me it was just kind of like okay well this is a thing um and Mm -hmm. you know the cool I guess (laughs) which is not to say I've had difficult you know I've not had difficulties after that right like obviously you know we still live in like a heteronormative society but um Mm -hmm. I definitely in terms of kind of dealing with like the internal stuff you know self-acceptance and all of that um you know I think I was very privileged to have like avoided most of that just because of like how like I isolated I isolated myself just like watched watch a lot of tv and read a lot of fan fiction um which is um in a way just kind of shielded myself that excites me so much for gen z and the next generations that like like my partner's I guess it's his second cousin actually but they're like nieces and nephews Mm -hmm. is 12 and she's very much queer and like I've kind of just adopted her (laughs) but um (laughs) But like, she didn't have to come out to her mom. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Uh Scarlett, do you realize like how lucky you are? Like, I know I sound like a boomer right now, but like, (laughs) 
it's amazing. And like, I am so jealous of you that you mm-hmm. just got to like come home and tell your mom like, oh, I have a crush on this person and like didn't even disclose the gender of the person because like it wasn't a thing like you knew it wasn't going to be a thing Mm -hmm. so you know I just had absolutely no media representation no escape no hope for anything Mm -hmm. you know and so I just it makes me so happy to see like like yes write that gay fanfic put it out there like <laughs> I wish I would have had that growing up yeah Maybe no I, 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 I wrote gay fanfic I wrote gay fanfic <laughs> when I was like 13 you know like I was like reading it by when I was 11 and I was writing it when I was 13 um mm. you know like <laughs> mine was just in my mind <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah you know like I think um I, I think the internet provided some kind of great spaces for me to explore that and mm. even though I didn't really realize I was queer until I was 18 I was just like a very enthusiastic ally like until (laughs) I was 18 um (laughs) like (laughs) um but but yeah like you know like um I I definitely you know was an environment where like I could like explore and I do you know I do hope that um that to be the case for you know people kind of you know younger than me right like so you know me like me and I like we're both on you know well I'm on like the cusp of Gen Z like you I feel are firmly mm-hmm. in Gen Z you know I'm 23 yeah. or 22 like I'm a 1998 baby you're uh, 1999 right um mm-hmm. and so like um but but yeah you know culturally I'm very like I'm very Gen Z like definitely that more so than millennial um and um yeah like although there are definitely kind of some like slang uh and stuff that I don't get and I have to definitely look look through the TikTok trends and go like what the hell are they saying <laughs> um but uh you know I have a lot of I have a lot of hope for for the future um but on the flip side though um uh, Sky like I know that you know one of the reasons why like we de- you know we decided to kind of uh, do this do this particular um episode I guess um was because of like a trend you'd been noticing in your TikTok comments from, um, you know, kids who are currently, you know, younger teenagers, I guess, like what you call like generation like alpha, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, would you yeah. like to kind of talk more about about like what you've what you've observed? Yeah. Um, so with like, I guess, older Gen Z people are just pretty solidly Gen Z. Mm-hmm. Um, I did see kind of like this awakening, like having the realization that kind of what Nayeli was talking about, like bringing that anarchism into um, relationships and Mm. just queering your entire life, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm like pulling that queer card and it just applies to everything. But um, this younger, younger generation, um, I find is very anti-polyamory, pro-monogamy, and in a really... um, if you're spending time with this person, then you're not spending. And I I feel like it's this, again, capitalism, like commodification of time. And I got into a conversation with somebody where I was like, I am trying to understand where you're coming from. Like, do you equate, like, what is, what is a, um, a portion of love to you? Is it like an hour spent to you equals like this amount of love? Like, how are you measuring that in your brain? I, I genuinely was trying to understand because I don't work that way. You know, I'm also neuro- neurodivergent. And that was kind of another awakening for me after I had like my first queer relationship. I was like, that was only two months. And that was like more deep and more profound than like my four year relationship, <laughs> you know, with the man. <laughs> yeah. So, so just this like fixation on time and um and energy i think goes hand in hand with we we are selling our time and labor and our bodies to capitalism Mm -hmm. you know so of course we're gonna bring that thinking into love and um yeah it's not so much like a moralistic thing a little bit um but yeah just kind of that 180 again like we're getting back to oh i could never do that oh i value commitment so i would i could never love multiple people Mm -hmm. oh I believe in not sharing my partner like that kind of rhetoric is showing up in my comments from very very young people and Mm -hmm. I don't debate them because they're you know 12 years old but it's just really (laughs) it's really disturbing and I and I really hope that you know I don't know I I hope that they just come out of that I mean I was a dummy at 12 too I'm like we all are we're 12 years old like I shouldn't you should not have internet access at 12 years old but um (laughs) hot take (laughs) I (laughs) but I think that like it's really interesting for me that you guys were talking about or Nayeli was talking about how you didn't fall for that you know 
monogamy bullshit in high school. And I love that for you. I definitely did. Um, I mean, I used my, I used my boyfriends as, um, obviously a way to solidify my straightness and, um, as social capital, Mm -hmm. definitely. Um, Mm. but, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard that Esther Perel quote where she said monogamy only exists in reality. It doesn't exist in the past and it doesn't exist in our minds. And I kind of remember like having that moment in my mind, like I had been indoctrinated with the Disney indoctrination, but I had witnessed all these people getting divorced around me Mm -hmm. my entire adolescence. And like in high school, everyone is just fucking everyone. (laughs) And it's like completely normalized. They're like, so it's okay that you waited two weeks before dating Brittany and then moved on to Ashley. But like, why couldn't you have just done that at the same time? (laughs) You know? So that's the thing that cracks me up about monogamous people, but I'm hoping that that like maybe sets off some light bulbs plus, you know, the influx of, um, better representations of, um, non-monogamous relationships. I'm hoping that will help, but yeah, it's just like a very weird trend to see. Yeah, like, and I remember, like, you know, in the in the creators group chat, like, when you brought this up, I was like, whoa, like, that is so interesting. And then, yeah, like, I think you said something along the lines of how, like, you know, um, because of, like, the climate emergency and just, like, generally, you know, all this general global unrest that's been going yeah. on, like, I think that that has, like, a big impact on um on like the psyche of you know like young teenagers today and you know maybe that's kind of influencing like their beliefs uh, I'm not going to speak on your behalf though Nayeli can you kind of just uh basically kind of uh say what you said back then because I thought it was a really interesting point honestly I don't even remember exactly what I said last time I feel like all my ideas like they're just they're all connected somehow so um but in response to what Sky just said um yeah I think an issue that well honestly I'm not too worried about like these young kids like you know everybody talks shit about things when they're 12 like they'll be fine (laughs) like once they actually have to move out of their parents house and reality hits them they'll change their minds right um which is also why Gen Z I think is getting so radical it's like once you're confronted with the reality of late stage capitalism some light bulbs Mm -hmm. go off right um but I do think it's interesting how I feel like each generation like their whatever ideas about what relationships should look like um their parents had and how they fit into that narrative of like whether their their family is broken and if they see it as a broken family or if they just see it as non-traditional but they don't see it as inherently flawed like that totally shapes like how Mm. you're going to what you're going to think about relationships because I feel like a lot of younger kids right now they don't understand the full structure of why everybody's relationships are a disaster and like for me I understand that it's because in a way we're kind of also in late stage mononormativity honestly Mm -hmm. um it's like we're starting to realize that spicy take (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's like we're starting to realize that the structure of mononormativity also mm-hmm. doesn't benefit us and it doesn't benefit us in the long term resistance against all these other oppressive structures that we're trying to undo. So mm-hmm. I think as more people start to realize the mechanisms of all that, you'll start seeing how your decisions in your personal life are also connected to everything else and if people don't understand the larger picture they just see like oh well I see that my parents are divorced and that's really shitty and that affected me as a child which is also like I like my parents are divorced I'm just saying like as an example um Mm -hmm. like you know people see like okay this is what my life looked like and historic like from what I know um the solution to this is that my parents should have stayed married or they should have picked better people to stay married to but in reality that's just conforming to the standards and that's a way to reform an inherently oppressive system which is yes. mononormativity so yeah that's another thing like i need to make an infographic about this sometime because like i feel like um what was i going to say like modern monogamy is technically a reformed version of really ugly um human commodification of bodies specifically like femme bodies um like a really horrible version of monogamy that was established like many years ago so Mm -hmm. in a way though you can't just get rid of like the original dynamics of it like at the end of the day a lot of people started normalizing monogamous relationships because they needed a way to build patriarchal structures and they needed to know that like this child is my biological child and like there's just you know so many other factors um like the patriarchy does rely on monogamy in a way um so that's another thing to think about but yeah yeah 
Yeah, yeah sure. I talked about too. I did a TikTok on um, how capitalism loves monogamy, specifically toxic mm-hmm. monogamy. I'm like, can you guys imagine, like, just think about all the media that is created that centers around toxic monogamy. All of those rom coms, mm-hmm. those big, you know, cinematic every pictures. Every song on the radio. Every song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, also just, um, you know, feeling that insecurity in us to buy more things, to do more things, to compromise, in mm-hmm. my opinion, um, to be loved and to buy into that dream. And then, yeah, you're buying a house together and you're buying a bunch of shit together. And then you have a kid and you buy a bunch of stuff for them. And then if you mm-hmm. get divorced, you buy another house. And it's just, yeah. it, is, why so much buying? Hand hand. Why so much consumerism? Why so much buying? <laughs> yeah. yeah, why aren't we sharing and Valentine's the Day? You know, like right. you could be talking yes. about Valentine's Day and all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, it's wild. It's super wild. Um, you know, like something um uh, when when you mentioned Asta Perel, uh Uh, sky like that kind of reminded me of something else that I wanted to address you know we're going to be talking about like you know the current like state of affairs and 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 you know like what's going to be going on in the future right like you know as I'm sure you've you've both noticed right like this year has been like a really big year for polyamory Mm -hmm. Uh, I think in terms of like getting kind of awareness of polyamory um like into the media like as into like the zeitgeist right like you know there have been way more articles about uh, like non monogamy and opening up your relationship and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff this and year than there have ever been a lot been of them are before. bad <laughs> and unfortunately a lot of yeah. them are bad but it is something right you know <laughs> there trying. are they come from psychologists yeah. too yeah I is... know. such a bummer <laughs> yeah but like you know it's been it's been like a huge you know cultural moment I feel um I mean you know even in like I started my page like a year ago and then like sit you know in the year that I have been running this page like so many new kind of pages have popped up like in in mm-hmm. in that time like talking about this stuff right um and you know like I I I do think it is no coincidence that it happened at the same time as like you know COVID. late stage pandemic I guess <laughs> you mm-hmm. want, like right. late, late stage capitalism late stage like, what late year stage are we pandemic. in of the coronavirus what? now um yeah but I, I don't think it's an accident that like you know as countries open up open up relationships have been opening up and it reminded me of a phrase that Esther Perel uh, said one time because so as for all, um, like, you know, her work is, you know, informed by, like, her experiences kind of growing up in, in, in a town that, you know, was affected by, like, the Holocaust and, you know, like, people, like, still kind of having a lot of that uh, intergenerational trauma, like, from all of that, from, from kind of that experience. And uh, something that she talked about was how... Um, because you know a lot of her work is based in like infidelity and how, why people cheat and you know like mm-hmm. a desire in long-term relationships and like how to cultivate that and how like monogamy um you know isn't like the best structure uh, like for quite a lot of people and that kind of thing right and one of the things that she said was how um infidelity was uh in some ways an antidote to death um, and while she was specifically talking about infidelity in this case, um, and I do think that like the, a lot of the wisdom that she says about cheating uh, can apply to uh, kind of non-monogamy and polyamory, um, because like, you know, she says things like, you know, when people seek like an outside connection, like outside of like the mm-hmm. pair bond, the dyad or whatever, you know, sometimes it's not so much that they're looking for another person, but they're looking for they're like another themselves. version of themselves. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then, and then, um, and then, you know, regarding the, what she said about the antidote to death, it's like um you know she noticed that in her, like amongst her clients um a lot of the people who came to her with like cheating stories like usually these stories happen immediately after like someone in the family died or like someone mm-hmm. someone experienced an illness like someone like developed terminal cancer um and um and then so you know like the infidelity was a way for them to like feel alive again almost and kind of Mm -hmm. because like that kind of the shadow of death like made them think like is this it you know is this who I'm going to be with like for the rest of my life and that makes them question everything and that's why you know they like they cheat which is you know really tragic you know it's it's super tragic but um you know like I and that makes me think right like I wonder if this is what it is you know like the pandemic you know people like dying all around us is making people Mm -hmm. go like wow, you know, I'm in this marriage and, you know, this is it, you know, like I might die like, you know, in, in a month or, you know, less than that, you know, like what, what what's going to happen? And that kind of instability is making people go like, oh shit, you know, you know, are there other options kind of? And it's so weird. It's really weird. 
Um, and I think also probably like a good amount of it is also just like maybe people are stuck in lockdown with their spouses and then realizing they hate them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which I is, think, yeah. 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 There's I also mean, an I element of that as a well. A lot of it. I think it's like a perfect storm and I'm yes. so excited to mm-hmm. see it. Um, I love that. I am such an Esther Perel stan, if it is Same. not clear. <laughs> Same. Um, yeah, absolutely love her. And like her TED talk on cheating, I feel like I'm like, I don't want to give her too much credit, but at least for me, I think that was like a cultural card in the house mm-hmm. of cards yeah. because I'm like, finally, we're fucking talking about it. Like, mm-hmm. can we talk about the fact that cheating is like so normalized and so stigmatized and like how it's a symptom of like a broader issue, like the problem with toxic monogamy? <laughs> Like, it just needed to be said. Everything that she said in that TED Talk, I was just, like, snapping the whole time. Yeah, yeah, no, genuinely, it's just, like, mind-blown, like, yeah. know, every five seconds, like, genuinely, like... Yeah, yeah. and then her, on her podcast, too, which is one of my favorite podcasts ever, you know, mm-hmm. she posts recordings from her sessions, and I think it, like, is so earth-shattering to hear other couples be so vulnerable and have those like realizations in real time kind of what you were talking about talking about like what the what the affair meant to them acknowledging what it meant to the other person and um I just don't think we've talked about relationships that way it's Mm -hmm. always been this understood like taboo you know like yes cheating is a thing but like we can't condone it or we can't question like why is this happening so much so yeah I credit her with so much with like how we're having those really tough discussions now and opening the door for monogamous couples to have even have those discussions like because of toxic monogamy that's what I say when I'm talking about cheating is that people are put in this impossible situation because you can't even have that conversation with your partner you it's it's a betrayal and like a shattering of self even to admit that you've experienced attraction to exactly else. exactly because, you, because then you are telling them our relationship doesn't matter. I don't love you at all. Nothing that we did mattered X, Y, Z, all this bullshit. And it's just yeah. not true. So, yeah. So yeah. a lot of people who are cheating are not bad people. I have cheated and I have mm-hmm. been cheated on and both feel not equally shitty, but shitty in their own ways, because you're doing this in order to protect your partner, but you know that it's wrong and you know that you're hurting them. It's just this impossible situation. Yeah. And, you know, like I've got like a, you know, related to that sky. I think it's actually very pertinent that you brought this up because I've got a post coming up. Uh, it's already on my Twitter, but, you know, I usually post my Instagram posts like much later than when mm-hmm. I put out my tweets. Right. Um, like I basically wrote a thread of like the, the one time that I cheated in a relationship um, and how, you know, like I'm not proud of that choice, but I do feel that like it was a justified necessary evil. Um, mm-hmm. and it's definitely spicy it's definitely a very spicy thread yeah. um yeah but like you know I get like you're gonna to bring... definitely get some hate on that one but oh okay. yeah 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 but okay. um you know like I definitely kind of want to bring light to um how like cheating is a very multifaceted issue like it's not so mm-hmm. black and white and I think like one of the one of the most like things that like Esther Perel said in her talks was the victim of the infidelity is not necessarily the victim of the marriage um and that like how like, well some yeah and just distancing to, like, take from ourselves from yeah and she talks about how it's important to not have the binary of victim and perpetrator mm-hmm. and like we need to just get rid of that and look at it at the like the multifaceted situation that it is yeah yeah absolutely and so yeah anyway like we all as the Perel stands she's great I you know I like I think if <laughs> there was I like do. one yeah if there was one person who what? would like no, sit down at dinner no. it would be her what I was gonna say like I I do appreciate Esther Perel's work although I do see Esther Perel as more of like a mononormativity reformist and not yeah. an abolitionist I know so she's that's where Kim Talbert Bernie. comes in though because yeah. Kim Talbert is full-on like okay we need to abolish this um yeah. so yeah I do <laughs> yes. relate a little bit more a lot more to Kim Talbert's work but I do think yeah. that Esther Perel's work is really good at like introducing people into thinking about these concepts like in a greater yeah way. yeah I think you need yeah. people on all sides of kind of that right Right? because like you, you I think if you do like chuck people in the deep end like a lot of the people mm-hmm. are just going to be like Ugh! no but then I think mm-hmm. like as the Perel like while I, com- I completely understand what you mean by like mon- mononormativity reformist I think like she straddles that middle point that kind of gets people to like mm-hmm. you know sit on the fence a little bit more and then <laughs> and then we, and then we yeah, can push them sure. to the other side <laughs> yeah. 
um i mean like you know we had that same argument uh, we had this same kind of discussion when uh uh remember when i posted that like right wing yeah, article, article like in from a quillette mm-hmm. or like whatever it was like in in our chat and then we were all just collectively losing our minds over it because it was this right wing <laughs> person like talking about um like talking about the benefits of polyamory but from a very like pronatalist and like heterosexual yeah perspective and just going like yeah but you can still have like your dyadic marriage and then also have these things or benefit like mm-hmm. the di- and it's just like why are we focusing on the yeah. couple still like what is going on um yeah that's yeah yeah, that's yeah. Just general, yeah i think like, people mm-hmm. oh i was sorry just gonna i was gonna say, say like <laughs> no like i just i think that like naeli and i can probably relate to that too like why i am so turned off by most like polyamory content or even like main accounts because they are all either Mm. like dyads or triads yeah and very still like the language and everything is very mononormative yeah it's still very reformist yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I agree it's like a lot of times I think especially like the media's obsession with triads is all about just trying to reform polyamory into mononormative standards so yeah it's it's like monogamy plus one yeah yeah (laughs) yes exactly it's like they're still have they're still perpetuating a lot of the same like capitalist and colonial ideas mm-hmm. about like having ownership over people's bodies if it's like an exclusive toxic thing um so yeah it's like it's not that different but also like the media would never actually talk to like any of us so it's no. like about these things so yeah no, I'm so not really so normalized, but but like in a really yeah mononormative way like I was at um a party with or whatever social gathering so it was like friends of my partner friends of friends he's not really that close with her I say that because like I just don't really like her that much (laughs) and she and and I was overhearing this conversation she is very like a monog and I can just tell that she doesn't like me either because I am very much just like (laughs) you know like (laughs) clear polyamorous like fuck everything and I know that that's like a threat to a lot of people's whatever Mm self-concept So um, anyway, I was just like overhearing this conversation. She was like, yeah, Brad and Kimberly or whatever the fuck their names are. Um, they have an open relationship. And like, but but like it, it makes sense. Like they're doing it the right way. Like they have a contract and like they're like not allowed to do this. Like they're not allowed to have sleepovers. She has to approve everyone, um, blah, blah, blah. And she's listing all these things, just veto power, unhealthy rules and restrictions. And I had to say something. I was like, that is immoral like what they're doing is wrong and it's not going to last and they're going to break up <laughs> oh my God. And she, went, she was yeah. just like no like it's really healthy and blah 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 and then I kept overhearing and yeah she has this new partner and it's like total new relationship energy and she's getting lost in it and her partner is getting upset and she's already broken all these rules on their stupid love contract and I'm oh like how many gosh. times do you guys need to do it's this it's giving like, it's all ethical non-monogamy <laughs> It's doing unethical non-monogamy yeah yeah no it's just, like there are definitely so many things where it's just like okay like you can have agreements but then if if the moment yeah. you try to set rules around feelings you are setting yourself up for failure um mm-hmm. like unless you're in you know um yeah. you know like that's what I realized because like when I was in you know my my first kind of non-monogamous dynamic was like your standard open relationship you know sexually open but not romantically open and then um and and I very you know over time like I very quickly realized that like you know I I didn't want to just kind of have like meaningless hookups and one night stands all the time in in order to kind of avoid like building like a more emotional (laughs) like romantic connection right (laughs) like I um you know and what I realized eventually was just like (laughs) like why am I why am I kind of getting so getting so like getting my knickers in a twist over um (laughs) over over like you know, my, my partner also like ha- having a deep connection with someone else, like it's fine. It's literally fine. And so, you know, um, yeah, like I, I kind of moved from just general non-monogamy to, to polyamory like over time, because I was just like, this is silly. Like, why, why are we worried about this? <laughs> like, you know, I, cause like the, I know so many, so many couples who like have like a sexually open dynamic and they only, you know, engage with other people at sex parties or like, you yeah. know, you can go on, you can go on dates, but you can only go on three and then you never see them again. Um, and, yeah, and it's just like, blows my mind. Yeah. Like that's uh, where my asexuality comes in because I just mm-hmm. could never do that. Like I just, I need a, an intimate connection with somebody before I sleep with them. So mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. just that rule would never work for me yeah like absolutely um but yeah like you know like I I think that um currently like 
everyone is just questioning a lot of things you know like I think you know throughout the pandemic uh when people have not much to do and they're stuck at home and they're lost in their thoughts you know so many people have, like I have three friends come out as trans to me in the same week um like, <laughs> um and you know so many people are realizing that they're neurodivergent because like their routines are crumbling around them and they're mm-hmm. like fuck mm-hmm. um and they don't have like the same coping strategies they did anymore <laughs> no, um like- and then you know like a lot of people questioning monogamy and going like oh my god you know like uh, we're in this kind of global crisis and yeah. like like the you know stuff needs to stuff needs to change because you know clearly um you know I, I feel like there's less uh I think you know monogamy is very rigid in some ways and it doesn't you know when when kind of circumstances change then it doesn't allow for like a lot of flexibility I definitely think that non-monogamous dynamics um uh, they offer more like fluidity and versatility and resilience right like through mm-hmm. um you know through like various circumstances in a way that I I personally feel monogamy does not yeah you know? I feel like it's really interesting when people say that like monogamy feels more secure to them because it just feels the exact opposite to me yeah yeah it I feels like, to use like and analogy. I hate that phrase uh, oh okay I want to hear your analogy because I hate saying like putting all of your eggs in one basket it's icky. I use a table what. analogy actually okay go okay. on if you have I, I a table <laughs> yeah so I like to describe it as like if you think of your partners as your support system your emotional support system who fulfill all of your needs let's say that's how you sustain yourself if you are a table and your partners are the legs so if you ever encounter a situation where you lose part of your emotional support system you lose one of the legs on the table um, and you have like three other legs on the table who could be your other partners, you'll be okay if you lose one of the legs. Um, you can still sustain yourself. That's a much more sustainable structure. But if you are in a monogamous relationship where you have one person like fulfilling mm-hmm. all of your emotional needs and yeah, something yeah. happens, something happens to that one leg of the table, the whole thing comes down. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's particularly the case if like, you know, if, if you're one of those monogamous dynamics where like you're not allowed to have close friendships outside of it. Right. Um, because like fulfill mm-hmm. like emotional cheating, um, yeah, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then yeah like you know so like there's like the common kind of uh, joke right like oh yeah like he's got a girlfriend now we don't see him anymore he doesn't come and hang out with the bros and then like right. uh, that relationship blow, blow, blows up and he doesn't have any friends and you know like, it's and this is so common this I think is so that, that just plays in again to late stage capitalism and why we are all so fucking lonely mm-hmm. and yeah. I think that that's what really radical radicalized me and why like my polyamory and relationship anarchy is absolutely a part of my politic because like at this point in time the last thing that we need to be doing is isolating like we need to be Mm -hmm. forming intimate connections of all kinds and relating to people so that we can fucking organize and overthrow capitalism (laughs) so it's, so it's just so upsetting to me like it actually it was the closest like to heartbreak that I've felt in a really long time. And it was like, not a romantic relationship or anything. It was just like a guy at work. And I was like, Oh my God, like we were just chatting and like bonding. And I was like, we should grab a drink sometime. Like I like hanging out with you. And then this like look came over his face and he was like, I don't think my girlfriend would like that. And I was like, Oh God, <laughs> what? Subtle ways mononormativity breaks your heart on a regular basis. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I was just absolutely devastated. And I almost went into this thing too. Where I was like, first of all, like, I'm going to assume that you guys have some, some stupid rule that you can't hang out with like girls. And I was like, well, I'm not really a girl. Like I am in like a very queer way that your girlfriend and probably you don't understand. <laughs> so I'm like, technically we're like outside of that gender rule as it is, but that's the I, most, I just, that's the most neurodivergent <laughs> response I have ever heard. You're like, technically I'm not opposite gender. So no, I'm just <laughs> other. Yeah. But I just wanted to shake him, you know, and be like, I know you want to hang out with me too. And like, how is this not hurting your soul? to say that and like how are you not having this realization how like oppressive that is so Mm -hmm. um it's just really it's it's upsetting for me and I always joke about with monogamous people I'm like are y'all really monogamous or are you polysaturated with one person because Mm. we have no free time under late stage capitalism Mm. and I think a lot of people are getting radicalized by that because they're like girl I don't have enough time for even one partner and I'm like 
why? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I have to work so yeah. much. And I'm like, why? Okay, yeah, and, there yeah. we go. Yeah, the no, and I think, yeah. The anti-capitalist pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, and I think it's super telling that, like, whenever I talk to people about monogamy, um, no, oh, sorry, whenever I talk to people about polyamory, like, the main, uh, the main kind of justifications that people have for, like, saying, like, that's why they practice monogamy or that's why they don't practice polyamory, they always say, like, I could never share my partner or mm -hmm. I would get too jealous. So notice that both of these things are to do with, like, their partners having other partners right mm -hmm. they like both of these statements are to do with i could never deal with my partner having other partners no, so they don't say anything about like whether they would be able to handle multiple partners because like yeah. i do think that most people are like this is my hot take and i've been saying this for a very long time i think that most like monogamous people are like almost kind of coerced into monogamy because like they like they themselves want to have multiple partners but because they don't want their partners having the same freedoms then they mm -hmm. force themselves into monogamy to coerce their partners to also be yeah. monogamous right like yes. most people most people aren't mm. monogamous because they actually like only desire yeah, one partner be. that's why people mm, cheat yeah. because yeah. they want to have that but then they don't want their partners to have the same freedoms that's my exactly. hot take um that's historically that's hot. exactly I, how it was reformed too like it's like oh okay well woman couldn't have multiple partners so now i'm gonna have my man also not have multiple partners like that's literally how the whole transition historically yeah. happened so oh. it's just having men holding them to the same standards yeah so, yeah yeah rather than yeah. and it's funny because it's like we should have gone in the opposite direction instead of women going like yeah. well we've had to be monogamous this whole time so you have to be monogamous yeah. as well it's kind of like no i want the same freedom you do. <laughs> give me yeah give, yeah exactly <laughs> give me all that <laughs> and then Nayeli, did you do you feel like it's like the advent of modern birth control for women that shifted things or was kind of like I think that was a yeah. factor, yeah. Yeah. I would yeah, say. that kind of yeah, probably. Um although it's also how the under like settler colonial governments how they wanted to build our families like even if we didn't have birth control today if we had a matrilineal matrilineal um communal way to support our children things would still look really different we wouldn't have such focus on monogamy either so it's mm -hmm. like birth control plays a factor but also like if we reimagine every other aspect of our society mm -hmm. um that also wouldn't even be an issue so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and I, you know like hence like you know on remodeled love love's page like you know one core question that that jess gets quite a lot is just like who's the How father do you know that that's your kid yeah yeah and so it's just like why is everyone though? focusing on this yeah like, why does it matter yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, shouldn't you care about every child in the every society child? anyway? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like, why does it matter if they have your blood? Don't you want them to have a house, be happy, mm -hmm. not have any emotional neglect? Like, there's just like a general, like, why do you only care about your biological kin anyway? Like, yeah. we need to shift to non biological kin. For sure, Absolutely. for sure. Well, yeah. I think like that's all we have time for today. Um, but this has been like we covered so <laughs> much like in this hour, you guys. Like, oh my god. <laughs> I know. Like, we you know, we talked about like Scientology, we talked about uh kind of late stage mononormativity, we talked about like how the pandemic influenced all this stuff. Like we talked about like, oh my god, you know, this has been such a rich conversation. Um and yeah, like thank you for joining me on this. So uh so uh Nayali, where can people find you on various platforms? Yes, so I have Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. My Instagram and TikTok are at anti mononormative, and my Twitter is a slight variation because I could not fit into the character limit. But you can find the link to my Twitter on my link tree on TikTok and Instagram. Okay, um, and Sky, where can people find you and your art? Um, so my art account is Fem Meow Pulp, F E M M M. E O W pulp like pulp novels. That's also my Twitter handle. On TikTok, I'm femmeow underscore, and then my meme shit posting account is just femmeow. Okay, beautiful. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, um, and have a great day.